sounds out to be complicated. So I think I've broken the back of it. I think I've basically figured it out. Does anybody have any um, questions or uh, areas of interest or anything following our last chat? Hi, Jimmy. Good Hello, here. Korean. Yeah, I am interested to know more about FastJam generally because I just Googled and found it very curious. Mm -hmm. We will get to that. That might be a little while though. Hi, Jeremy. I'm, I'm Joe. Hi, Joe. Um, where are you I'm uh, joining us from, Joe? Uh, oh, just about seven minutes away from where you're at. <laughs> oh, you're in the, on the Redcliffe Peninsula somewhere? No, in, the, in sorry, I thought you were in Brisbane. So uh, I'm, in I'm in Redcliffe. Uh, Redcliffe. Not too, that's about seven minutes away. <laughs> so it's still a um, question I have. Um, like, really impressed with the blogging sort of setup out of Jupiter, and just I'm curious what your workflow is and how you are able to um, do an experiment and be able to blog about it very easily. Because I find I've got to move it from this GitHub to another sort of yeah. thing, and yeah. there may be things in that space. And yeah, cool. definitely. I think yeah, I think we've already. Let me just double check our list of things to cover. Yeah, how to blog is actually number one of our list of things to cover oh. in our walkthroughs topic. And I don't think fast chains there yet. So let me add that. Fast chain. There we go. Um, oh, these are all good questions. Um, I'll uh, introduce myself. Uh, I'm Matt from Britain as well. Um, I, Hi. Uh, how you I would like to, um, I think uh, we started looking at setting up Jupiter Lab last week, um, if I remember yeah, correctly. Briefly, yeah. And uh, so I think we'd installed Jupiter Lab um, PyTorch. So I even managed to get that working successfully okay. on my, my laptop. Did that all work okay? Yeah, uh, it was. It works. It's apparent. It looks like it's working. Okay. Um, so, and I managed to um, install um, fast AI as far as I know. Um, so, I guess being confident that I can work on that on my machine would be. Yeah, could, that's actually what we're going to do today. I think we're going to focus on, uh, yep, get our own kind of start doing some work on our own machine. Yep, exactly. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, let's get underway with that. Um, so, Um, just to explain something, oh, um, just to explain something you might have seen last time. Um, I I have two different users in my WSL installation. I don't normally, but it's just like I just wanted to mention that in a, in 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 a Linux, you know, distribution, you can add multiple users and and switch to them, um, and uh, so. Uh, the way you switch between users is by typing uh, sudo minus u for username and then the username you want, and then minus i to open up an interactive terminal as that user. So that's why you see me doing this sometimes. Uh, so when I do that, you can see it's like said, oh, welcome, jph00, and kind of starts from scratch. And you can now see before the at sign, it tells me that. The only reason I'm doing that is so that I've got like an empty user <coughs> that doesn't have anything installed or anything set up. So I don't accidentally assume something that, <clears throat> and um, fail to create something. Um, generally speaking, there's, you won't normally have a reason to uh, create multiple users on your account, unless you want to kind of set up something like this, that's totally separate. Um, so I, <clears throat> yeah, I thought we could try to like create, you know, a notebook and a Python script 
and put them in a Git repository. And, you know, just kind of go through that workflow, basically. Um, <clears throat> so I normally create a directory to put my, my Git repository. So what's a Git repository? A Git repository is a folder containing files and potentially subfolders, um, which um, uh, basically, uh, to simplify slightly, you can easily store somewhere else. Um, and the most pl common place people store it uh, uh, is github.com, uh, where they provide free storage of Git repositories. Um, and most interestingly, uh, Git keeps a kind of a copy of <coughs> every version of your files, uh, and you can switch back to any previous version at any time. So if you ever mess something up and save it and then realize later, oh, I messed it up, you can, you can go back and get an old version. Um, so maybe before we create our own GitHub repo, we could look at a GitHub repo. So we could look at the fast AI one. So GitHub, as I say, is just one particular company that stores Git repositories for you. Um, you don't have to use them. There's also one called GitLab, um, but um, I don't know. Most people use GitHub, so I think it's easier to go, go you know, be where everybody else is. Um, and so this is an example of a repository. <clears throat> um, so a, the, the name of the repository is FastAI. Um, and then that belongs to some particular person or organization. In this case, it belongs to an organization. The organization is called FastAI. Um, so if we get rid of the first of those, the last of those fast AIs, this is the organization fast AI, and you can see the 119 repositories that are in that organization. So if I click on one, say fast release, see how the URLs change. This is, this is now the fast AIs organizations repository called fast release. So this pair of things with a slash is basically a unique identifier in GitLab for a repository because it has the username or organization and the repository. Um, so FastAI is an organization. My <coughs> GitHub username is jph00, and then that also has repositories. And so I can click on one like Tiny Pets, and you can see this is now the Tiny Pets repository in jph00. Um, okay, so let's go back to the FastAI repository. So a repository, as I mentioned, contains folders and files, and then folders can contain folders and files. Um, they can contain basically any kind of folder or file, any kind of file you like. Uh, they ask that your files, <coughs> <coughs> that each individual file is smaller than 50 megabytes. They don't particularly enforce that though. Um, so that's what we see here. There's a special file which is a file called readme or readme.md. And that file is special because in this display, it's automatically shown in this repository website. So a kind of minimal useful repository is something that just contains a readme.md file. And in fact, as soon as you have that, you have something that you can, a website you can show people. Um, so maybe we should start by doing that. So if you go to your own GitHub page, um, <coughs> github.com slash your username, um, you can click repositories. And so you might not have any repositories yet, which is fine. Um, and here you could click new repository. So why don't you go ahead and do that? Click new repository. Um, and so you need to give it a name. Um, walk through three. If you want a description, not a bad idea to remind yourself of what things are. Sample repo for walk through of fast.ai course. So <clears throat> you can make it private so nobody else can see it or public. Um, something you'll hear a lot from fast.ai folks, the community, alumni, myself, is that um, the more you can work in public, the better, the more you can share your 
your portfolio, the better. Um, something which a lot of folks aren't used to and can feel uncomfortable. But like here's here, you know, here's a place you could start trying that is to make this public. If your default is to always make things private, maybe try not doing that this time. Um, okay, so we can yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, walk through the second, please. Walk through to. Sorry. Uh, the second walk through. Oh, we are the going second through. walk. Through. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know why I imagined that there was another walk through. Maybe I dreamt it. Okay. <clears throat> I guess it's because it's the weekend. It's been a long time. So we can say add a readme file. Now there are some things that you don't want to put in Git, kind of like temporary files and stuff like that. And uh, there's a special file called .git ignore, which li lists all the kinds of files you don't want to store. Um, so if you click on here and start typing Python, this will kind of create a list automatically of the kinds of like Python's intermediate files and stuff. Um, so again, it's a good idea to use a license that allows other people to use this. If you don't, then other people can't use your code. Uh, I always use Apache license too. And the reason for that is that it's like, gives users you know, really as much flexibility as possible in how they use the code. But it um, also has a clause that minimizes the chance that I'm gonna get sued for patent violations or that people would use this to kind of enforce patents in inappropriate ways. Um, so, Wait, Jeremy, can I, can I ask a question? Of course. Um, sorry, my name is Mark. I'm from Hi, Toronto. I, I'm representing North America here tonight, I think. Great. Uh, or this morning. So, um, late night for you. <laughs> well, it's only nine. It's okay. Uh, oh, you're at the, of course, you're West Coast, I see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're east, but yeah. Um, the, uh, sorry, can you just go a little bit more into the Git ignore and I, I didn't quite follow what that Yeah, what let's that create the repository and take a look at it, um, okay. shall we? So I'm embarrassed. I've actually been to Toronto and I'm <laughs> completely butchering my geography. It's and sorry, nice is this the way you city. want questions asked or do you want hands put up or something? I like, I don't want to yeah, I like, I like, you know, as informal a conversation as possible. Okay. So yeah, I'm not even sure I would see if hands go up. So here's, here's the repo we just created. And um, if I click on Git ignore, it will show me the contents of that text file. And so here is the text file called git ignore with line numbers on it. Um, you can see it without anything else by clicking raw. So that's this is just what the text file contains. Um, and you can see, for example, um, in Linux, a .so file is a compiled C library, <clears throat> which is not something you'd normally want to save into a repo. So star.so, star means anything.so. So C, X, C library files would not be stored. Um, Python has a cache of things that it's pre compiled, which it puts in a dunder pycache directory. So this says don't put that in, in, into your Git repo. So basically, when, you, when we add stuff to Git repos shortly, um, it will by default not include anything that matches these um, these patterns. Does that answer your question, Mark? Uh, it does in, in the sort of literal sense, I guess. Okay, I, sorry. tell me more about what your non-literal sense is. Well, so so I understand that it's, um, I understand that these are the files that will be excluded, but mm -hmm. I guess other than just always choosing Python for git ignore. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to decide which files to include and which files to exclude. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, we'll we'll see that as we go. Um, okay. What one one example that will come up if it's not already in here is um, Jupyter stores backups, uh, the most recent backup uh, saved copy uh, in a backup directory called IPy checkpoints. Um, you would gen, you know, and when you go to git add, you might say, oh, it's adding this directory called IPy checkpoints. I don't want that. And you'd be like, oh, okay, I'll put it in my git ignore. So it's generally like if you'll see things that you're like, oh, I don't need that to be backed up. Or like, oh, that's the thing that contains my password. I definitely don't want that in my public git repo. So those are the two main reasons. It's either stuff that doesn't need to be there or stuff that you actively don't want to be there. Oh, okay, so but but choosing the Python for Git ignore is a, generally a good first. This step. is a good start. So this is just kind of pre-populated it with a bunch of lines that we'll we'll add to later as we find stuff that we don't want to include. Okay, you. so you can see it's created a readme.md file, and if I click that, you can see it's here's its contents. 
and that's the same as the contents down here. And so we could like create, you know, a little website now, which is basically, I mean, website's a bit of, you know, I guess it's a website by editing readme.md. So if you click that little pencil, we can now edit. So try editing your readme.md. And this is, um, this is Markdown, which we use in Jupyter, we use in readme files. It's kind of used pretty much everywhere. Um, and so it's well worth getting used to. Um, so at this stage, the Markdown file, you've got one line that starts with a hash. That means this is a level one heading. Um, a level two heading would have two hashes. Introduction. Okay, and then you just put things on, on separate lines of text. So this is a sample repo or walkthrough of the Faster AI course. And then if you want a new paragraph, just put an empty line between them. This is another paragraph. And then, you know, you can have lists by putting hyphens. Okay, and so forth. And maybe have another header here. Okay, so if I save that, it doesn't say save, it says commit. Um, so this is um, a concept in Git is that you don't just save things, but you create um, you know, a, a version, it's called a, a commit, um, which is basically all the changes since last time you saved. So commit means save, but it means save with version control. And so when you save, um, you need to have some description of what the change was that you made. And optionally, you can add more details about it. So by default, it's made a description for me. Um, so I can commit my changes. And so now if we go to our repo, you'll see that we've got more in our readme. Um, you'll also see that this repository now has two commits. So if I want to go back and see what it used to look like, then I can see here's the initial commit and here's my update readme. If I click on this commit code over here, it shows me the difference. So things with a minus and a red are things I deleted and things in plus and green are things I added. And this is called a diff, a diff for a difference. Um, and so very often people will, you know, say that they want to have a look at a diff to see like if you've made some changes to their code to see what changes did you make. Otherwise it's very difficult to know what somebody did. So this commit gets automatically gets a little unique name as you see, and we can see the diff. Um, or you can even click on this little button here, browse repository at this point in the history. So you can go back and pretend that life was before a minute ago and see exactly what this looked like back then. So this is now looking at the state of this repo before I made the change. So Git, Git is pretty handy and GitHub is a very useful place to store stuff in Git. Um, so generally speaking, we don't normally edit things directly with the GitHub editor because it's pretty basic. I mean, I do sometimes, you know, if I, if I just want to make a quick change to a readme, I, I will sometimes click that pencil button, but more often I'll do it on my computer. So to put it on my computer, we need to clone the repository. So cloning it means making a kind of a, a linked copy on our computer. So you see this code button here? Um, we can clone it. We're going to clone it using something called SSH, which is something we'll use a lot. Um, and SSH is a way of logging into remote computers and also automatically doing stuff with remote computers and copying stuff from remote computers. So here is a, a URL. It's not to a website, but to a, a Git repository um, using SSH. So I can click here to click copy. Right, so I've copied that. So how do I clone it? Well, the first thing I do is like say, let's keep things organized. So I like to have a directory for all my cloned Git repos. So I'll go make to Git, CD Git. And so if I go print working directory, you can see I'm in my home. 
and remember that tilde is a shortcut for your home. So I can now type, so get is a program on your computer. And so you can type get clone and then the URL. So I just pasted it. Okay, so there's a lot of security stuff built into SSH. And one thing is to make sure that you don't accidentally connect to places you didn't mean to. Um, you know, I, I don't use that much of the security stuff because I'm not too worried, you know, for most things I do. So in this case, it's just saying, you sure you want to connect to this new place? Um, and I'll just say yes, and it's going to save that. Okay, so permission denied. All right, so I've asked to clone a repository using SSH, but I got permission denied. And that's because um, to use SSH, you have to use an SSH key. So the first thing I mentioned is if you want to clone somebody else's repository, you can use HTTP instead of SSH. So I can click here, HTTP, copy, and then I could clone that. And that works fine. That's a perfectly reasonable way to work with other people's code. Um, so if I go CD walkthrough two, here it is. And I can edit the readme. And then I could go down and I could add something else. And um, the problem is I can't save that back again um, without logging into GitHub. Um, so if I try to commit that, I'll explain committing from the command line in a moment, um, but I just want to show you that um, Oh, okay. So the first, uh, next thing to know is if you want to um, save stuff back to um, back to GitHub, it needs to know your name and email address. Um, so it tells you some commands you can use. So one approach would be just to paste them in, right? And obviously that's not the right email and username. But things like this in the terminal, they basically always create hidden files in your home directory. So if I just type CD, it takes me to my home directory. And you can actually see here, there's now a file called .git config. And so I could edit that. And here we go. So info at fast.ai say, Jeremy Howard. All right, now I'll show you a little trick which most people don't know. Um, I want to go back to the directory I was in before. I could type cd git slash walkthrough two, or I could just type cd space hyphen. And space cd hyphen means change directory to your most recently used directory. So that's very handy to do. Um, one issue with that is if you've like cd three or four times, there's no kind of history there. So what I would do if I want to come back here later and I'm going all over the place is instead of typing CD, you can go push D, which is the same as CD, but it remembers where you were. So if I go push D and change to my home directory, I'm now in my home directory. I can CD to downloads, I can CD to NBs. How do I get back to where I, were, were, where I was before? Well, I pushed from git walkthrough too. So I can pop, if I type pop D, there we go, I'm back where I got, was originally. So there's a couple of good tricks for zipping around in your um, directory structure. It's a bit like pressing the back button, I guess, almost on, on a browser. Um, anywho, if I now try to save my change, and the way you do that, we'll talk about it this more in a moment, um, is you push. Um, you can see here it's asking for a username. And so, you obviously can't save things to other people's repositories if you don't have their credentials. Um, it's also annoying to type in your username and password all the time. Um, so I never use, almost never use HTTP get clone for my own repositories. Instead, I use SSH. So let's delete that directory and get clone with SSH. So I click SSH and copy. 
And let's take a look again at this error we got. Okay, so why do we not have permission? That's because it doesn't know who we are and it doesn't know that we have permission to copy and change this repository. Um, SSH is really nifty. It doesn't use passwords. Instead, we create a secret key on our computer called the private key and a second thing called the public key, which we can give to other people. And then anybody who has our public key will be able to accept, uh, we will be able to log into basically, but they can't log into us. That's why it's cool. It's not like a password. It's a one way thing. So we can get into GitHub, into our um, repos, um, but nobody on GitHub could like log into our computer or anything. So we need to create um, it's called a key pair, a public key and a private key. So to do that, you type SSH, oops, dash key gen, SSH key gen. So that's generate SSH keys. And then just hit enter, hit enter again, hit enter again. All right. So that's created keys in my home directory in .ssh. This one here is the private key and this one here is the public key. So we need to tell GitHub about our public key so that we can log in there. So to display a file in the terminal um, without like uh, basically show it all at once, you can just type cat. So if I go cat in my home directory .sh .pub, there it is. Now there's no problem with me showing this on a live stream and it being on a video. This is not in any way private or secret because this is just something that lets me, if it's, pl it's placed on another computer, it lets me log into another computer. In fact, it's even stored publicly, like anyone can access this public key or Jeremy because it's on GitHub. Yeah, so, uh, so let's put it, well, we've got to put it on GitHub. So let's do that. We so, put it on GitHub. Yeah, so let's go try. back to GitHub, yes. click on my face and um, probably going to be in settings somewhere. All right, uh, here we are, SSH and GPG keys. There we go. Um, do we not add them here? Here we go, new SSH key. Title, I'll just call this the walkthrough key and paste. There we go, add. Maybe add the username I used. All right, so that is now in my account. So I should now be able to rerun that git clone command. So remember, if you press control R, you can type a few letters from a previous command. So I'll start typing clone and there it is. And so if I hit enter, now it's working. So I don't have to worry about ever typing in a git password, GitHub password. So here we are, great. Um, let's make sure I've closed my other Jupyter session, I haven't. Jeremy, I noticed when I did that, when I did the SSH key gen, yep. I already, already had one. Okay, uh, no worries. So if you've already got one. So no just problem. use that one. Yep, just use that one. There should be an ID, ID RSA or ID DSA or something like that. That's your private key. And the one that ends in .pub is the one you'll copy over. Yep. And so you don't need Jeremy, like- Jeremy, how did, you just, how did you just split your terminal like that? Uh, we will learn. It's something called TMUX, okay. T-M-U-X, but we'll certainly be covering that. One of the best things ever. Um, all right. 
quick question. Jeremy, one thing that question. I just thought might be interesting for people or, or just to, uh, something that can catch people out is making sure that <clears throat> your identity that you set up in your terminal, uh, as you showed before, and that um, the email that you use in GitHub, said that, that they're consistent. Sometimes if you are using a, a different email or especially if you, it's probably not a, a case here, but if you have multiple GitHub accounts, you can end up um, you know, having one identity making commits to a repository that you didn't intend to under that identity and, and back and forth. So just, um, it, it, just be careful when you first get started that you're using a consistent email identifier like yeah it's not necessarily always um, important for your public key but certainly for your identity on github and for where you're going to be making commits and things like that um it, it's often helpful when you get started to make sure they're consistent yeah i mean i don't honestly ever think about that i kind of just chuck in any old email address it doesn't like it's it comes up sometimes but not too often um because it's kind of mainly informational, I think, this information so that other people can contact it's, stuff. I, I find I found it's more down the line, if especially if you have a separate GitHub account for personal and a separate one for work, then um, if you if you have different identities or different emails being associated with it, then when you make a commit to a work repo, you've accidentally committed it from your personal one, which you didn't mm -hmm. want to reveal your identity on or whatever. Yeah, so, fair enough. <clears throat> yep. Okay. And does somebody else have a question or comment? Yeah, just a, in the same context, like you said, the public key, even if somebody else knows it, they cannot commit to your Git. Mm -hmm. Is that because the private key is unique only on your computer? Like Correct. just a high level? Correct. Yeah, okay. The private key yeah. is the secret code. So if you wanted to be able to, um, you know, log in from another computer, you would you would copy the private key over there and then that, that computer can log in. Yep. So the private key is the thing that says, I, pr I can prove I'm Jeremy Howard. And the public key is a thing that says anyone who proves that Jeremy Howard can log in here. Oh, thank you. Yep. No worries. <clears throat> this uh, is uh, something that is that this way of authentication is used uh, across many different contexts. So GitHub uses it. But uh, uh, for instance, uh, today I was installing Ubuntu server on my local machine and I could point the installation to take my public key from GitHub, just to make things easier. It's grab the public key and it's set it up so that I can easily connect to my computer without any additional setup steps. So yeah. there is absolutely no danger given uh, the current state of mathematics, uh, you know, to making this information public. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, without that, you know, going via HTTPS and password authentication that makes it for such a cumbersome uh, GitHub workflow that this is so, so much better. Yeah, yeah, SSH is used everywhere. So for example, I've got a GPU server sitting next to me here, which, um, and then I've set up a, um, oh, somebody at my door. And a tick. Our doorbell keeps switching itself to a Christmas chimes for some reason. Um, yeah, so I've actually created a profile here for logging into my box, which uh, as you can see, it just calls SSH. So, and then that's uh, attached to control shift three. So anytime if I want to log into my GPU box, I hit control shift three and here I am, I'm now you know, typing in just as if I was at my own computer, but I'm actually now typing into my GPU server. Um, so SSH is a good thing to learn about properly. Um, okay, so we have, Jeremy, yes. uh, with regards to creating repos and committing and I mean, what we are practicing right now, hmm. you, I guess I'm in the course itself, you show how we can deploy an application. And sometimes you need to do the same thing. I mean, git push to those applications. Yeah. And just wanted to see, is it possible to have both GitHub and also pushing, 
a repo communicate with two different destination sources, mm -hmm. if it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. And we'll, we'll be seeing that once we start looking at hugging face spaces. Yep. Okay. Yep, you can. So um, you can have as many repos as you like. And each repo kind of has this kind of default destination it's connected to, which will normally be GitHub, but you can even connect one to multiple destinations um, and <laughs> choose which one you're pulling and pushing from and to. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Can I ask one more? Yes. With regards to the token password that you mentioned that for, uh, for that ignore file, just wanted to see if that is important only for the public reports or even a private repo on GitHub you shouldn't share token passwords or- Yeah, I would more. tend not to. I mean, it depends how important it is, you know. Um, I mean, at least the people on GitHub can see it. <laughs> um, so, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would try to avoid putting private stuff onto public websites in, in general, um, mm -hmm. particularly things like that, where it's like, at some point you might decide, oh, I want to make this repo public. And then you forget that somewhere there was a, at some point there was a secret file in there. And, you know, one thing to be very aware of is even if I, um, in fact, let me show you, um, let's create a super secret file. And my secret is I don't like bananas. I don't want anybody to know this, right? But let's say, you know, it was a currently a, um, a private repo, pretend. And so if we put that into GitHub, because it's fine, it's all private. And then I push that over to github.com. And then later on, I say, oh, okay, I want to actually make this a public repo. So I need to delete this from, from, from GitHub. So I'll git rm that file. remove secret and like, okay, now I make my repo public. Everything's fine. Nobody has to know that I don't like bananas. And then I can check on my repo and okay, my super secret file's not there, but remember commits, let's go back to the world as it was. Oh, it's here in my history. Right, when you remove things from GitHub, it removes it from the current commit, but it's not changing history. So people could still find out my secret. Jeremy, I just um, I just noticed there as well, that was a, a good example when you looked at those commits of the, um, the identity issue we were just talking about before, because on that commit screen, you had some commits that were verified because you will have had an SSH key that was tied to your GitHub email, you see you've got those first two commits there are verified and then the latest two aren't. That's because you just created a new key. So that's a but the, the key you won't have had the same email ID as your first one. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's an example where, especially like if you are trying to make verified commits, if that's important to some project you're involved in, um, yeah, that's where that'll Fair trip enough. you up. So I just thought I'd mention that. never been of interest in my projects. So I guess I've never thought about it, but yeah, it's, uh, this one was, Actually, yeah, because you know anybody could create a .git config file that says I'm Linus Torvalds and push, and it'll say this is a commit from Linus Torvalds. Um, it won't say it's verified. Um, yep. But, yeah. Um, okay, so um, let's put a, a, a notebook in here. So um, I can run. Jupyter Lab, and I think we created an alias last time, JL. Um, and I pointed out that at this point, it's, it's, you know, this terminal, I can't use it anymore because it's busy running Jupyter. Now I could run another terminal session in Windows Terminal, um, but I actually never do. Um, I actually uh, always use um, instead something called Tmux. Uh, Tmux is something which um, actually runs inside your terminal. So regardless of what operating system you're on and what your term preferred terminal is, you'll always be able to use Tmux. And let me show it to you. If you type T 
Tmux. Um, well, the first thing I'd mention is if you type Tmux, um, it might say command not installed. Um, and if it does say that, then in um, Linux, you can type sudo and sudo, um, if you don't say what user to run it is, it says run it as an admin, it's called root, right? So, so to install software, you have to be root. You can say sudo apt install means install Linux software or Ubuntu software, tmux. And so that's how you would install tmux if you got that error. And so to run stuff as root, you have to put in your password. And so in my case, I already have tmux. Okay, um, but yeah, so that's that's what you would do. On um, Mac, you would normally use brew, um, which unfortunately does not come with Mac. So if you, as it says, it's the missing package manager. So if you just copy and paste this into your terminal in Mac, you'll then be able to, should be able to do brew install tmux if you double check that it's available. Yep, it is. So brew and apt are equivalents for Mac and Linux. And remember when I say Linux, I'm including Windows as Linux because it is it is Linux. So once it's installed, if you type tmux, you'll get a new screen that looks exactly like your old screen, but now it's got a green bar on the bottom. Um, and this is what tmux looks like and it behaves the same way as usual. Um, You know, one thing is if I kind of like go off the end of the screen, it's nice I can use my scroll. Um, if you've got this mouse set up. Um, but you know, basically it just looks like a normal terminal. Where things get interesting is that I can add additional windows. Um, and so in Tmux, everything, um, <coughs> almost everything you do Tmux um, starts by pressing the, uh, key, the keyboard shortcut control B. Control B is the, the Tmux shortcut. And so let's say I cd into git and I run JupyterLab. I always like to run it from the place where I've kind of got my notebooks and repositories. And I'm like, oh, okay, what do I do now? Well, I'll create another GitHub window. Uh, sorry, another um, Tmux pane. I should call them Tmux pane. Um, and I can create another, uh, either split them horizontally or vertically. So if you hold, hit, hold, hold down control, press B, nothing happens, and then press percent. So control B percent. And you can see what that's done is it's created a second window over here. As opposed to control B double inverted commas, which creates another window down here, a pane. And you can close them in the usual way. And remember the usual way is control D. And each time you close them, they just disappear. So I pretty much always do that. Um, now, then how do you move around between these different panes? Um, depending on how your terminal is configured, you might be able to click with your mouse. I never do. Um, I just press control B and press arrow keys. Control B right, control B up. See how my cursor is moving? Here I am in the bottom right. Control B left, now I'm in the bottom left. Control B left up, now I'm in the top. So that's how you can move around between the panes. Um, and then another thing to know is um, this window looks very small now, this pane looks very small. I'd like more room, please. To get more room, you zoom with Z, so Control B Z. So if I press Control B Z, that makes that pane take up the whole screen. And once I'm done, you know, and I don't want the whole th the thing to be maximized anymore, I just press control BZ again, and now it goes back. Um, okay. Sorry, um, yeah. Jeremy, what? How did you get the four by four? I so um, I'll show you that again. So it's, let me go back to where I was. So um, I'm going to first of all split vertically. So that'll be control B double quotes, oh, sorry, control B percent. And then I'm going to split the one on the right. Um, 
up and down, so control B double quotes. And then I'll press control B left to go to the left hand tab, the pane, I should say. And then I'll go control B double quote again. And there okay. I've got it. And you kind of like, there are things you can do to make that automatic, but after a while, you get so used to it that like I show you when I do it, I just go control B percent, control B double quote, control B left, control B double quote, and I'm done. You know, it only takes three seconds. Um, and then the other nice thing about Tmux is it sits there running in the background for as long as you like. So I can actually detach from this Tmux session as long as I don't turn on, off my computer by pressing control B D for detach. And then I'll close down my whole terminal. Everything's gone. Okay, don't have a terminal running anymore. Um, oh, that's gonna be annoying to have to set everything up again, get to the right directory, rerun Jupyter Notebook, blah, blah, blah. Um, but actually I don't because I detached from Tmux. So no, all I have to do is attach to read Tmux again. Um, I do have to be the right person. So let me go back to my extra account. To attach to Tmux again, you type Tmux A. A for attach and everything's back. So that is one of the very handy things about Tmux. And so if you, yeah, if you've got some long running job or something, it's totally fine. You can detach if you need to and come back to it later. Um, obviously if you reboot your computer, it won't work. Otherwise it should be fine. I think they're the main, yep. Yeah, just to confirm, if you close any of these windows, that ends the process, that kills the process. Yeah? No, I just closed the window and it didn't close the process, but I detached first. So control B, D to detach and I closed the pro and it's all gone, it's closed. Sure, but I mean that at the beginning when you split into the four and then you close the three and then went back to the original dev. So for example, there won't be the Jupyter oh, lab. If you close, if you close a pane, yeah. Um, so, Yeah, so like the, the pane here, I can't close it because it's running a program. So the only way to close that would be to actually cancel the program. This pane's not running anything, so I can close it. So I can just hit Control D. And so that just closes that session. And then if I do Control B double quote, it just creates a new session, a new, a new uh, interactive login, if you like. So each of these windows are totally separate to each other. So if I over here CD into walkthrough two, you can see none of the other ones are, you know, these are all like separate copies of bash running. This way, one over, this copy over here is actually running Jupyter. Um, all right. Jeremy, one more doubt, uh, like can we SSH into a different session from uh, Tmux itself? Yeah, so um, absolutely. So I, I, you know, I could SSH into my machine, into my GPU machine from here. Um, oh, I need to be not JPH00. So let me just do that as somebody else. Yeah, so I could uh, SSH into another machine. No worries. You can even run Tmux inside Tmux if you want to. It gets a bit crazy. Um, yeah, they're all totally separate. Um, okay, so let's, so we've got Jupyter running, so I can control click on this URL to open it up. Ah, that's interesting. So that didn't work because do you see how it's wrapped to the next line? So it didn't get the FA91. It's kind of not considered part of it. Um, that's why this didn't log in correctly. So what I could do is to um, zoom in with control BZ and then click on it. There we go. Um, the other thing you can do is to set a password, which isn't a bad idea, um, but for now we can just use this. It's because it's using this uh, unique token that it auto creates. Um, okay, so because I launched um, Jupyter Lab from inside the Git directory, that's why I'm here inside the Git directory. So here's walkthrough two. So I could now create a notebook. 
um, turn that to a markdown cell. So um, I strongly recommend learning the keyboard shortcuts, um, which, what's the easiest way to see that in a lab? I'm much more familiar with Classic Notebook. So here's Launch Classic Notebook, which is what I normally use in Classic Notebook. You can hit H to bring up the keyboard shortcuts. Um, let's see how to do it in Jupyter Lab. Jupyter Lab keyboard shortcuts. Advanced settings editor in the settings menu. Doesn't sound very friendly. Settings, advanced settings. Okay, that's control comma, keyboard, keyboard, keyboard. There we go. All right. Um, great. So anyway, the keyboard shortcut to turn a, um, change a cell to markdown is just to hit M. And so this is now markdown, as you see. Um, or to switch it back to code, you press Y, and that's now code. Um, another useful keyboard shortcut is you can just press one, two, or three to create a first level, second level, or third level header, or change one, one to a header, as you can see. Um, so, um, Walk through sample notebook. Here is how I calculate one plus one. Put things in back ticks to, to say this is to start it as code. Here is how I calculate sign. So if you hit shift tab after typing a function, it'll tell you the parameters and so forth of a function. A equals array in point. Zero comma pi over two, whatever. Sign A. Okay. Um, so by default, things get called untitled.ipynb, which is not a great name. So you can rename it to sample, whatever. Now, if I close that, Um, it's actually running. So that, that, that Python session is still in memory. Most of the time that doesn't matter, um, unless it's something where you're like training a model on a GPU, in which case it continues to use your GPU memory. So a couple of things you can do. One is rather than closing from the X, you can click um, close and shut down notebook, which is control shift Q. Um, or alternatively, you can click the X here. All right. Um, since we've got a proper terminal um, on our computer, we don't really need to use it much, but FYI, you, you know, and we will use it later, you can create a terminal inside your browser, which is identical to the terminals we've seen before. And just like before, Control D will close it. All right, so we've now got um, another file called sample.ipymb. So we would like to put that into our GitHub repo for other people to, to share and just so I've got a backup and so it's version controlled and so forth. Um, so everything you wanna do in Git, you first type Git. Um, so 
what you'll often do at this point is type git status, which tells you what's in git and what's not in git. And so it'll give you a list of untracked files. So these are things you haven't yet got in git. So to put it into git, you have to commit it. Um, so if you type, um, so if you type git commit, um, that'll commit anything that you've added to git. So first of all, you have to say, okay, what do I want in my next commit? I want sample.ipymb. So git add sample.ipymb. I'll zoom in. Okay, so now this is a, it's not untracked. It's now a change to be committed is that we've added a file. Um, so now we can commit what we've added by saying git commit. And then it'll say, okay, tell me your commit message. And so by default, it's opening up an editor called nano um, and we can change this, but nano is probably like the easiest editor to get started with. Um, so it's not a bad place to start. Um, so let's put in our uh, commit message for people to see what have you done? Uh, we added sample notebook. And you can see down at the bottom that we can exit by pressing control X. And it'll say, do you want to save? And I'll press Y for yes. And by default, just leave the file name as it is. So hit enter. Okay, so that has now added the file to my commit. So if I now say git status, it's now in a third place. It's gone from untracked to do be committed, to be committed, and it is now committed. And that means it is now actually version controlled on your computer. So Git actually version controls things on your computer, even without using GitHub. Um, in fact, originally when Git was created by Linus Torvalds, there was no such thing as GitHub. Um, and people kind of uh, sent changes to each other directly rather than going through a server. Um, but in this case, we are connected to a server. And it said, oh, your, your branch, so your copy of this repo is ahead of the copy, the place that you got it from by one commit. So use push to, to send your commits back to the server. So git push. There we go. Um, so now if we do git status again, there we go. So that's the whole cycle. And so if we now go back to GitHub, there's our notebook. And GitHub does have a basic notebook viewer. It's not amazing, but it does the job most of the time. And so there's our notebook. And so here's like a really minimal way of like, it's not a blog or anything, but you know, to just like quickly share things with people, this is the easiest way to do it. You know, and you can just say, here's, here's a repo. And you know, you can create as many repos as you like. Um, so like, don't feel like it's in some way inappropriate to create a repo for one or two notebooks you wanna share with somebody. Um, it's totally fine. Um, you know, I generally have kind of a repo I put somewhat temporary things into. Um, but you know, often when we're kind of sharing something with somebody else, for example, the bug we found, we want to show how to recreate the bug, we'll just like create a repo just to send somebody an example of, of a bug, for instance. So uh, yeah, so repositories, you can create as many as you like. Um, a really good way to use repositories is Let's go to the fast book repository. Is it would be nice to have your own copy of the book because you would like to run cells, edit things, stuff like that. So um, if you clone this, right, you won't be able to do an SSH clone at all because my because your uh, public key is not in my account. You can HTTP clone it, but you won't be able to save changes back to GitHub. So ideally you'd like your own separate copy of this. And so you can create your own separate copy of this by clicking fork. And so fork's gonna create your own copy. So you just say create fork. Here it is, a fork's a copy. And you can experiment with changes without affecting the original. 
And here you go. So it looks exactly the same, right? But now I can SSH copy this and then CD. So CD dot dot means go to the parent directory, which in this case is git. Git clone paste. Um, actually, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, so we'll go git clone. There we go. And so now it downloads the, the whole book. And so now if we, in fact, let's do it. Let's open up a, a notebook. So let's go back to Jupyter Lab. Fast book. And Mr. Basics. Actually, you know what would be good would be, let's go into the clean version. Because this is really the one you want to be experimenting with. And so I can now start running cells. Oh, can't run fast AI. Fair enough. So um, at this point, we need to install FastAI. So we can see here it says conda install minus C fastchan fastAI. So I'm going to copy that, except for the conda bit because I want to use Mamba. So minus C, remember, says to bring it from some other channel. So this is not coming from the main channel, but from a channel called FastChan. So FastChan is a channel that FastAI provides where we try to put in, you know, a lot of the kind of pieces of software that data scientists are likely to want to use. Um, okay, so we can now say, yep, that all looks fine. So fast AI relies on the kind of the whole, you know, kind of ecosystem of Python scientific libraries. And since this is a brand new user, you know, things like matplotlib that's used for plotting, for example, and scikit-learn that's used for classic machine learning, then none of those were there. So um, because it relies on all these, it, it grabs them all, uh, downloads them and installs them. Can I ask a question while it's downloading? Please. Um, is it, you're, I noticed you're installing it in the base directory. Is that usually how you do it? That's how I always do it, yes. Yep. So you don't create separate virtual environments? Never, just no, the never. I, okay. Um, a lot of people do, but I strongly dislike them, um, particularly for beginners, um, uh, or unless you've got some very special reason, I always put stuff in the base. Okay. Um, and the other thing I noticed was that uh, the notebooks all use pip. Yes, they do, but um, it won't do anything for you because it says here, um, see if there's a, this is a bash thing. It says, see if there's a directory called slash content, which there isn't. This exists for um, something called Colab, which is a free Jupyter server environment, um, which doesn't generally have up-to-date things installed. In fact, I think they still have fast AI version one. So this cell will, on Colab, install everything because uh, Colab uses pip, basically. Okay. Um, but it, yeah, it won't do anything on our computer. Um, oh, and we also need FastBook. Now FastBook, I'm not even sure, I'm not sure if there is a kind of package at the moment for FastBook. So I will use, well, let's check. Mamba install minus C FastChan FastBook. I have a feeling that won't work. Oh, apparently it does work. There you go. Huh. 
Oh, that was easy. And actually, FastBook includes fast, fast AI, so we could have skipped the whole fast AI one. FastBook is just a, um, it's basically just a list of dependencies of like all the different things we use in the book. Um, it doesn't really have much code at all of its own. It's just a kind of quick and easy way to grab all the stuff that you'll need for the book. All right, so now we should be able to run this. Okay, um, that is actually, I think a little out of date. I think we could use any sentence piece nowadays. And I think we might have that in fast gen two sentence piece. That's something we use in the NLP chapter. Yep. Looks good. Wow, that's a slow download. Oh, it's speeding up at last. Let's try again. Okay, so now we've got a copy of everything we need. So this is like a unusually, you know, big uh, kind of set of dependencies because it's a big book that teaches lots and lots of things. But the nice thing is once this works, um, you know, you'll generally find everything you need is going to is going to work. Um, okay, so at this point, you know, I've started doing things. You know, maybe I'll make some notes to myself um, to install. Um, we have to go Mamba install. Basically, this is all we'd need. It would be Mamba install minus C fast chain fast book sentence piece. That would actually be all you would need to do. Um, so if I save this, and so now, you know, we've created a note to ourselves in our own copy of the book. So we'll close that. And if we now CD to fast book, git status, you can see it tells us we've modified that file. So we would like to save that back to our copy. Um, typing git add uh, and then git minus M and then changing things in the editor is a bit slow. So a shortcut is if you type git commit minus am, that minus a means add everything that's not committed. And this, this m here says, I'm gonna put a message right here on the command line. It's gotta be in quotes, um, change mnist, uh, maybe uh, add install notes. So at that point, if I type git status, you can see now it's gone ahead and added it and committed it. And it now says, all right, we're ready to push. So if I type git push, that same saved that change. So that change has not been saved to FastAI's copy of the book, of course, but it has been saved to the JPH fork. So at this point, my fork is one commit ahead of FastAI, right? So that is, I've made changes that are not in FastAI's copy. Um, and so I could see what commits there are, and that, and here's all the commits that I, are in the what I forked, and here's my addition. And here's the change, which says that I added this one cell. Okay, I think that's probably about enough for one day. Does anyone have any questions or comments about that? Um, the only one I found was that sometimes if you sort of, we started off creating a repo within GitHub, sometimes I've done the reverse where I've created the repo on my computer and then had a few issues trying to get it into GitHub. And yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, let's add that to our on. list of things to do in a future session. I find it easier to do it in GitHub. So I actually always try to do it that way. Um, 
like literally like it's because I find it so easy. Like I always have to look it up to remind myself how to do it otherwise. Um, mm. So often I'll like, I'll create it in GitHub, pull it and then copy over things that are on my computer. You know, like that's the really lazy way to do it. Um, but let's do how yeah. to create a Git repo locally. All right, let me pop that. Done. All right, thanks Kang. Um, so we're doing Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday this week. So uh, hope to see, see you then. See you thanks tomorrow. for joining us yeah. in Toronto. <laughs> bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks, bye.